time to start on part two, which is probably more like part six on this. Uh, it doesn't cost much to do these videos, but it takes a, a lot of time. And uh, hopefully uh, you'll see this in more and more manufacturers trying to uh, give you this kind of insight. Sometimes you're ready for this kind of a uh, project, sometimes you're not. But you certainly don't want to be disappointed uh, once you open the box, and that's part of what we're doing. So right now, Jack, what, what, I, what we want to get into is the secondary part of the building. This is the one that was based on a prototype right here in Maine. And this is the original Edwin Graves building before they got really big. And it's really cool, really interesting. Architecturally, it's kind of a plain Jane, but it works really well if you handle it right. And there's a lot of windows and a lot of uh, subtle details that really separate this building from the standard uh, model railroad kit. Yeah, there's a lot of windows because they're double windows to start with. So if you're putting your glass in the in individual in individual sashes, you're going to put a lot of windows in. But in the end, I think it looks really nice to have that done that way. There's, I think, 24 double windows. Okay, well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to turn, before we even get into this, I'm going to back off. And Lenny will reset the camera. And why don't you... Uh... Yeah, we'll go through this, this building uh, uh, as, we, as we did in the other building. A uh, little piece at a time. Yeah, we'll see you in a minute. Thanks. All right, we're going to discuss the secondary building, uh, the older, what we call the older Edwin Graves building. Um, it really isn't much different from some of the uh, kits that you've built from bar mills. Um, there is um, the four walls and the small extension on the, on the, on the one side of the building. Um, the only difference here, we have a larger corner board that we've used only because we've used this bottom um, boarding to make a, a visual effect on the bottom instead of just painting it. We actually put the boards on this time. So the uh, corner boards need to stick out just a little bit more which allows to this, this um, added piece to be flush with the corner board. And then we added a piece of trim across the top of that. Um, it goes on, all the way around except where the loading dock is. Um, we happened to just give us a, a green stain, which gave it a contrast to the white of the walls. Well, Jack, you know, just, just for clarification, the corner posts in this case are 5 64th by 5 64th. Normally, we use 1 16th inch square. So we gained a whole 64th of an inch. But, as it turns out, that the, uh, the laminate, the overlay laminate that sits below the windows on the bottom, well, 20% of the building are 64th of an inch thick, and it's to... Uh, is to blend things together and give it more of a natural look. Yeah, so when you put your corner boards on, you want to make sure that they're flush with the back of the wall and not the front of the wall, which you normally do. So they want to be flush with the back when you make your corners, so that'll give them the the, uh, the bump out that you need for the bottom piece to, to be flush with the corner board. Uh, the th next thing is that we did is this is a board by board construction on the top of this deck. Um, the boards will come with you, just uh, stick them down, glue them down, and give them a stain. It uh, straightforward goes, no problem. I mean, it was real easy to do. I think we're using probably scale 2 by 6s on that. 2 by 6s is what we are using. Um, right. And they go right on, no problem. You want to give them a little, the edge wants to be roughly smooth, but give it a little, little some variation. It kind of looks like it's being been used. It's real easy. The little uh, railing will be a layup railing. You can build that right up on a template. It'll be simple. No problem. The crane pieces, um, we put that together. We're going to have that out. It'll be probably very similar to what we have here. It's just a boom crane that's supported back on the building uh, with some wheels and some pulleys and a piece of rope and rust it up and you'll make it look like it's been there forever. Well, you know, that one that you built there was scratch built, but we're going to have a laser engineered one with the kit, so it'll look slightly different. Uh, but the look will be the look, uh, and that's really more up to the modeler. That's not something we can put in the box. Right. Yep. That yeah. little bit of rust and a little bit of uh, string in here all set. Um, the roof we used on this one is a cardstock roof, and it comes with the small battens. You're going to take a uh, battens. You're going to stay pretty stuck. You stick them right down. Paint your roof uh, whatever color you want. We happen to use a a copper patiner uh, to give it a little different than black or gray and it's the same on the cupola roof as it is on the uh, the, the main roof. But there is a the difference between what you will get in the kit and on the prototype when it comes to the cupola. 
Yeah, the Cooper is a little different. We uh, we uh, had this set of windows that we used, and the ones that will come in the kit will be four windows instead of five, so it will be very, very similar. It will just have a space in the middle. And, and the bands themselves are laser board, and they're self-sticking. If I'm not mistaken, weren't there lines already etched into the The lines are already there on the roof, so you can just follow the line and stick them in and get them straight. It works really well. And then when you're done, you're going to put your two chimneys down at the far end, uh, paint them up, and I just used some of the uh, spack wall spackle for my um, compound for the uh, for mortar lines. Put a little bit on, wipe a little bit off, and that's all you need to do for your... Uh, and some weathering chalks and it makes makes them look like they're used. You don't have to have every line covered, so it just gives you an idea. Well, let me ask you, on the ins on the underside of the roofing panel, the cardstock, mm -hmm. now I would think this would be pretty flexible. How did um, you handle that? You got, I did actually run a piece of um, bracing across the top of both sides of these walls, and then we ran another piece basically right next to where the opening is, which gave that opening a little stiffness so it comes to the end, but you can't overhang, you got to watch out for your braces on your roof. That gives you some stiffness when you're putting that little cupola in it, and it kind of holds it together a little better. Did, now, did you prime it, prime these surfaces at all before adding a final color of paint? Um, this color of paint on the cardboard is not, because I used a watercolor um, acrylic paint, and I like the way it absorbs into the cardboard, uh -huh. not, into the, not into the primer. But you painted you, you painted the surface after the battens had already been yes after the, the battens on you you paint the whole surface um, a, I used a I think it's called sea mist and then with my weathering chalks I just darkened up the lines did you paint this before or after adding it to the structure the roof was actually painted after I think I think I painted this after because you got to put your battens on and you want your center you need to put your center rib on so that should be done before you put it on so. what did you use for a center rib. Um, it's a piece of wood. I can't think of that. Um, I think it's sixteenth by sixteenth. It's a very small square. That no, it would be a lot smaller than a sixteenth because really? that's a corner post. Uh, but may maybe a thirty-second by a thirty-second. Might be a thirty-second that's square that you put on basically on edge in the in the. Cut. You put it as a diagonal. Yeah. Right. On the diamond shape, yes. So we're going to have to make sure we have that with the kit yes. so the uh, the yep. guys can follow through. Yeah, on that. and then your your battens will come right up to it and fit right in there really nicely. It's very simple to do. Um, the doors are laser cut. Um, I think all the doors except for the one door over here are all laser cut. They're an interesting door. They're um, actually like three small doors put together, which allows them to open any one of the three. Um, I, did do, I did cut one on this side. Um, they come in actually two panels and one panel when you put them together. I used one panel, left it open a little bit. It just gives it a little more interest. And that's the way the prototype was on, on this particular On building. that building it was, yes. They saved some money by using uh, separate doors and they just uh, hinged them together. Um, this also has the, the uh, window fans, same thing we did here. We cut out the mullins and, and brought the windows fans in from the back. Um, other than that, it's a straightforward building. Uh, the loading docks, believe it or not, are all cast in two pieces. They're uh, lays, um yeah, resin, I'm sorry, resin cast, and all the material that's on it except for the figures and some of the pallets are already cast in, so all you'll have to do is just paint paint your uh, your castings. Well, let's take a minute to, re, uh, to reposition this diorama, and let's back out for the second, and we'll finish up on this part of the project. Okay. One of the things uh, on this building that kind of sticks right out is your tall, tall chimney here. Um, basically, it's a piece of... Um, styrene tubing that we used and cut a base for it. Um, basically what we did we divided it into sections, even sections except for the little bit on the top, and then I ba use, basically use uh, plain old transparent scotch tape. All you do is you cut it into small thin bands maybe maybe an, uh, an eighth inch wide and then wrap it around the tube. And what that will give you once you paint it, once you paint it over, it looks like this actually bands welded right into the tubing. Uh, a little but, it's, but it's thinner than a masking tape band would be, right? Yeah, it's. I use regular plain old scotch tape. Very, 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 very Transparent. subtle. Yep, it's it's very subtle. And it takes paint well. It takes paint, no problem at all. I, it's The only the only Floquil paint that I still use is the weathered black because they don't make anything else in that 
particular shade. So it's the only thing I still use in a floquil. Other than that, I use all water-based paint. Um, once you've done that, you can take a little bit of your chalk and, and go around the seam and then drag it down. Drag the, the brush down this way. And it will look like the, the rusted part had actually run down the, the tubing. Um, the same thing on the top, you're going to do with some, some black and you're going to pull it down over the silver end or the, or the gray end. It gives it a little bit of, of uh, difference in the texture at the top. You know, we make this kit and I, I looked at it, I was thinking that it was metal. Because we had to buy, I don't know how many feet of it, to make sure we had it for the, uh, for the kits. This is actually, the uh, tubing is actually from Evergreen. And it's one of the few things we send out for, but here again, it's something that we have to keep in inventory for this, uh, for this project. Yeah, uh, it, 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 you can make it plastic look like metal or you can make plastic look like wood. It, it all's the way you put the finish on the, on the material. How did you handle uh, the construction on the back end of the wall as far as finishing details go? On the back end? Well, the wall that you're looking at, I noticed that the sign here again, another oh, dry transfer. Yeah, we got another dry transfer here. Um, you want to put this sign on also before you put your windows in. Right. Um, it's just easier. I actually, it would be easier to do it as the wall is a flat. Again, with a little bit of um, dull coat over the top, it allowed me to handle it a little bit. And then these are very, very dark black. If you want to weather them just a little bit, a little bit of gray chalk over the top makes them look a little faded. Well, let me ask you this. We kind of skipped over this, but you, me you mentioned that it's easy to apply the signs uh, while the walls are flat. Well, the fact of it is they have to be painted before you add the signs. Did you tend to pre-paint all of these things before assembling them? Yeah, you can paint. Um, the way I put the way I put my wall together is I put <coughs> Sorry, I'll put Jim. my bracing on and then I'll put my corner posts on before I put them together, which gives me a place to push. It gives me a little L-shaped piece on the corner, which allows me to put my two walls together square. By doing that, I'm able to paint the whole thing before I put it together. That is there, is there anything you do paint. after the full walls are assembled? I mean, whether it's window insertion or whatever. Um, usually I put my windows afterwards once the building is together. And then I'll do a lot of my weathering, actual weathering after that. It ties, it ties all the work together. Yeah, yeah. A little bit of chalk, a little bit of ink and alcohol, I will actually do that. You have to do all your weathering on your windows before you put your um, acetate in. But um, after that, you can then touch it up a little bit. Uh, we added, um, there's actually eight of the small um, hanging lights on this. We did the same thing with the lights as we did with the support bars by cutting a small piece of basically cardstock and sticking it on, drill a hole through it and put the light through there. It gives it a base that it, it holds against the wall, gives it one more little dimension. And those are our exclusive bar mill shepherd's hook lights. Yeah. Uh, so you don't have to go inserting wire into them. The, they, they are delicate, but on the other hand, they save an awful lot of work. I think it's one of the best things we've ever done. Yeah. And we paint, them right on, on, paint them right on the sprue before yeah. you take them off. Yeah. The only thing you can't paint on the sprue is the under, underside white. Right. Um, and then you get them all painted, you cut them up the length, slide them in the hole, and they're done. Um, they're pretty rugged. I was surprised at how rugged they are. Um, uh, they don't get bent or broken. Well, let's let's uh, do one more flip of the building. Take a, take a second to readjust the camera and tie up this end of the project. All right, we're going to do the last two walls on this on this building. Um, this wall is straightforward. It's got a little door in the front with a little, which all comes with the with the kit. It comes with the overhang and the pulley. Um, I added some of this this actually ship ship's twine. Um, you can get it anywhere. Um, it just adds a little more detail to it. We'll have we'll have some of that with yeah. the kit track. Yeah. Okay. And um, all you do is basically I wrap it around a uh, handle of a paintbrush and I put some water, some ink and al uh, some alcohol and water on it to make it wet. And then I'll put actually, believe it or not, ACC to to harden up the coil. It'll keep the coil in shape. Bend it do you want to make it look like it's hanging on a hook, and you'll get. Rope. And yeah, I've done that, you know, where you, where you actually put tension on the wire and let the ACC run down the, yep. ten, the tensed, it, let's call it wire, but it's rope. And then actually, once it dries, it retains that, the look of tension. Yeah, actually, if you look at these, they're pretty stiff. Uh, and that's not because they're being pulled. It's because we put ACC right, right in, the, in the rope. Um, we have these two loading docks, as I talked before, that they're made out of a uh, 
cast material that we, we use and then we're going to paint these to make them look like wood. And what I do, it's a, basically a three-step process. What I'm going to do is I'm going to prime them a flat white and that makes, um, by using flat white, I can repeat my process every time because uh, different castings are different colors so you want to start from the same color. By using a uh, golden brown apple barrel paint, I mix it up with water um, till it's a basically a wash and I'll wash that on um, over the whole thing that's going to be look like wood I don't care if I get it on the pieces I'm going to paint because I'm going to paint over them anyway um, slop it right on don't worry about it um, get it to where it's a, it's the darker of the color and then I'm going to actually do the same thing with a dark brown um, and I'm going to a very dark brown and I'm going to make up a wash and I'm going to run that wash over and basically what that wash is going to do is going to sink in all the cracks and crevices and highlight the wood and it's going to actually make it look like wood and you're going to do that till you get the the, the result that you're looking for and you'll see it as it goes it, it works out pretty well and then you a little white dry brush over the top and a little ink and alcohol and you're all done it, and then you go back and you paint whatever needs to have color on it like your oil barrels and things like that. Do you need much into dry brushing or not necessarily? I'll do some dry brushing. Um, actually, I probably do more than I think I do. Um, I do it on most of my castings because uh, it brings out the edges and the highlights. Um, Have you gotten away from alcohol and, and the ink? I personally, that's not my favorite because it's very hard to undo. Uh, I prefer working with something that is more built up, uh, whether it's powders or pad pastels, or in my case, I like using an airbrush because you have a lot more control with an airbrush than you do with a paintbrush loaded with alcohol and India ink. Um, the only thing I have not gotten away with is I'm going to stain my wood with ink and alcohol. Um, um, you can use Hunter Line. Uh, it's, this is true. I, I, I love Hunter Line. Hunter Line is good. Um, I like the ink and alcohol. It has a definite light color I, the color is completely different from the hunter line and i it's the only thing that i like about the ink and alcohol is when i stain my wood and uh, what do you what do you use to apply it on your surfaces as uh, on ink and alcohol i'll use a brush it'll be a smaller brush not a big brush i'm not going to slop it on i'm going to use it very carefully i think the big problem with it is honestly is the application and the control over Too much. because let's face it 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 it, uh, it absorbs it runs it's uh, it just fills in all the gaps now i've seen you do this before especially with uh nail holes that you you'll tend to not even necessarily use a black maybe it's a hunter line and you'll actually run down to fill the nail holes to accentuate them sometimes you can do that you got to be very careful with that that you don't end up using straight lines um uh, on the wall other than the nail holes this wall here believe it or not is painted white and then I did, went over it with the ink and alcohol and just actually it's a pretty good sized brush and let it run down it all depends upon the mix of your ink and alcohol I was going to say you use several dilutions I would right. imagine yeah you want to start with a light dilution and work your way to dark um, uh, or multiple let it dry and put a second one on build up in layers yeah, just yeah, like you would yeah. scenery or paint you're going to find out too there are some of the acrylic paints that they, it doesn't like to adhere to it kind of slides off it so if you let it put it on once let it dry and put a second coat on it's going to heat much better well those are finishing uh, tips here uh, I'm going to uh, spend a few moments discussing how I built the diorama uh, which is not really complete but I think I can give you a pretty good over over uh, you know, overview of, uh, of how I did this and uh, so we'll be right back with that final closing video of this series thanks Jack okay okay we're going to wind up this uh, geez this expose of this building I don't think we've ever done a video in so many parts hopefully you've had the patience to sit through this honestly uh, we're very proud to have been able to bring it to you and I certainly want to thank Jack he's uh, he's been such a great friend for all these years um, remember if you ever up in Maine to feel feel free to stop by we will be in uh, several railroad shows every year we do the NMRA national uh, every year we do Springfield Mass uh, on occasion you'll see us at the Craftsman Expo for instance as well as other shows around the country just as an overview here this is Gator Phone. There's a fellow named Dave Myers in Vermont. It'll be in the instructions. Tell you where to buy the stuff. It's half inch thick, 
Not everybody prefers black, but I love black because it's very easy to cover, and if you if you don't cover it entirely, white sticking up through ground foam is not as uh, is not as nearly as effective looking as black, where you t you don't tend to notice this coming through. Um, we build our dioramas uh, on a very small base uh, because because of transportation purposes, and. Um, Basically, this diorama here is not complete. Uh, I kind of had to rush it a little bit for the, uh, you know, to get an ad in for the magazines and to do this clinic, so you'd have a chance to see this. Uh, this diorama took me uh, one Sunday afternoon and one uh, one day on Monday to plant the buildings. One of the things that we didn't really discuss is the fact that you will have a piece of brick sheeting uh, that we use for the um, for the street included in the kit. Um, we glued that down, I primed it gray, I then hand brushed it with orange paint and then went back and airbrushed uh, weathering into it. Also uh, rubbed in some pan pastels into that and that helped. And there, you can hear the creaking of the floors, Big Lenny leaves the, uh, leaves the room. Uh, God bless you Lenny. Uh, and uh, so that will be with the kit. Also, the Insta fence does come with the kit. Uh, normally, you should put a lot of stuff around the fence. I just haven't had a chance to do that. Also, telephone poles come with the kit. Uh, we've included three of them. We think they're really cool. The nice thing about the poles in this case, because this is foam, is that for f photographic purposes, uh, we did punch them in, but they are very easily removable, and that'll come in handy during photography. Um, not too much to this. We tend to use... Uh, foam, uh, ground foam by Woodland Scenics, as well as certainly by Scenic Express. Uh, the vehicles were handmade for us by Mike Fuller. Mike lives up in Syracuse, New York. He's available to do this work for anybody who requests it. And here again, we'll give you that information. The figures this time around are from Woodland Scenics, and uh, we thought they fit fairly well. And uh, this is a fun part of the project. You just glue them down. There's really no effort to be put in. Um, the big thing is to make sure everything is down, everything is tight, and whether you want to display something like this on a shelf or on your layout, uh, it makes a great, uh, great, great diorama. Here again, I mean seriously, when I turn this around, if there's a if there's a lack of detail anywhere, uh, I mean we certainly don't pick up on it. And this is uh, one of those kits that. Uh, Yes, it is what it is. It's a lot of work and uh, a lot of engineering. Thank you, Mr. Jim Mooney, or Diamond Jim Mooney, as we call him. And uh, thanks to all of you for supporting us. Uh, it's always such a kick to get together and do these Christmas kits. Uh, we thank you very much. Uh, my wife, Nancy, myself, and the crew here at Bar Mills. This is Artie Fahey. Have a great holiday.